I just started learning Rust a couple of months ago, so I'm very, very far from being a Rust expert, but I've been enjoying the process of learning and I wanted to share a few things. I think the maybe audience here is like TypeScript developers who are interested in learning Rust and want to see someone who's also kind of learning Rust. We're going to be solving Advent of Code 2022 day one in Rust today. And I'm going to skip some of the details of the story because it doesn't matter too much, but essentially we're going to have an input in this format where we have one number per line and sometimes you have a space between uh, these kind of chunks of numbers. And the idea in the story here is that each chunk of numbers is the calorie counts for all of the items that a particular elf is carrying. We're just gonna look for the chunk that sums to the largest value. So I've got a folder here that just has my input text file and we can take a look at that. We can see exactly what we would expect. And we're going to run a cargo init to initialize a Rust application in this folder. So let's go ahead and open source.main. All right, so everything happens inside our main function here. And the first thing we wanna do is read that input file off the disk. Use standard colon colon fs to use our file system utilities and we'll replace this with a file system colon colon uh, let's do read read to string. One thing I'll point out here is that if you're trying to learn Rust or any other language, make sure your editor is set up to give you as much help as possible. As you can see, I'm not only getting good autocomplete on what methods I have on this FS module, I also have the documentation showing up here. And this is all just part of the language server protocol. So if you're using VS Code or you know some other editor that supports LSP, then all of this will be there for you if you just install the Rust plugins but uh, definitely make sure to do that if you're trying to learn the language. Okay, so we wanna grab the input.txt file. And this brings us to the first detail that I want to talk about in Rust here. If we take a look again at the documentation for read to string, notice that this function returns a result of string. Now, if you're not familiar with the result enum in Rust, it has two variants. One of them is okay, and of course that wraps the actual value, and the other is error, which is gonna wrap the error. So there are a couple of ways we could handle this here. One common way would be to use a match statement. And notice that my editor right away is telling me that we're missing two arms from our match statement, okay and error. And I can actually use the editor to fill in those arms. And this could work pretty well. We could write our happy path here in the okay block. And then we could write our error handling here in the error block. And in any case where you want to recover from an error, this would be great. However, I don't really care about recovering from this error because if I can't read this input file, there's really nothing for me to do. There's no way to recover for this program. The input is completely required. So I'm gonna back out of those changes. And instead we're gonna call a method off of our result enum here. And often you'll see unwrap being used. Unwrap is a great way to just grab the okay value and panic if there isn't that okay value. However, the one I'm gonna use instead is called expect. And expect takes a string as its argument. And this is basically the error message that gets thrown if the result errors instead of having a value. So I could just say something here like cannot load file. We should be able to see this in action actually. So let's do let content equal so that we put this into a variable. And then let's go ahead and just print content here. We can run this by doing uh, cargo run. Our file here has been printed out. That's great. If maybe I try to grab a file that doesn't exist, we can see we get our error here, thread main panicked at cannot load file. We also get the actual error from the file system. We also get the actual error message here, which is no such file or directory. So that's pretty good too. Now that we have our content, we can go ahead and start processing it. And one of the things I love about Rust when you're doing this type of data transformation is that we can use a functional like method chaining style of programming, which feels pretty natural to me. So we're gonna go ahead and split our string here on every double new line character. And that's gonna give us an iterator over the individual chunks of rows in our file. So we can use the map method here to map over those chunks. So we'll go ahead and take a chunk here. And this syntax is just a closure function that we're gonna to pass to map. And so now for each individual chunk, we can see that the individual chunks here are still just uh, slices. And so we can once again split those slices on this time just the individual new line characters and then map over those individual rows. And so now in these individual rows, we wanna convert that to a number so that we can sum up everything in that chunk. We're gonna expect that whatever we return from this map 
is something that we're going to be able to sum. So we can call the sum method there. For example, if I just say return one, we should be able to save this. And let's see, as you can see, I do have some Rust formatting in my editor, but notice now that we have an error here, which is that type annotations are needed. We can't infer the type for parameter B declared on the associated map function. What that means is our counts variable here is kind of unknown. We can see that we're doing a mapping and a splitting, but the resulting type is unknown. So let's go ahead and say we expect this to return a U size chunk and it got rid of my block. So I'm gonna to have to add that block back. But if I go ahead and save that now, okay, things are looking better here. So we'll talk more about types in Rust in just a second, but essentially this is declaring the return type for this closure function that we're passing through. So now our only errors are about unused variables, which is fairly straightforward. So let's go ahead and now use our row string here. So this is still a string, but we wanna parse it to u size. Now u size as our type here is an unsigned integer of whatever the maximum size that your CPU architecture supports. So for me, that's gonna be a 64-bit integer, but if I was on an older machine, this same program would compile and work for a 32-bit machine. Let's go ahead and do row.parse. What we're gonna get out of parse is a result not an individual value. So we're gonna do an unwrap, and this is where I like to use unwrap or. And so we're gonna use unwrap or and say zero. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm not really taking the time to make sure we trim each individual string. And so it's possible that maybe we get an empty line at the end of each of these chunks. This is also really one of the nice things about Rust, which is that it recognizes that parse may not always return a number, and it forces you to deal with that. Instead of giving you a number or throwing an error, it gives you a result object and you have to unwrap the result object and decide if there's an error in there, what am I gonna do with it? And so in this case, by using unwrap or and passing zero, I'm saying, if this result object has an error, let's just default to zero and assume that that works for our case. I can do that in this case because I trust the input and I know that or zero is not gonna change the result and it's kind of just a way to ignore the error. So now, what's the result of count? Well, count now recognizes that this is an iterator of u size element. Elements. So now we essentially have individual numbers. So now we want to sort these and find the largest one. So the easiest way to do that is going to be converting this iterator into a collection. So let's create a collection that we're going to call V here because it's going to be a vector and we can do counts dot collect type annotations needed once again. And this is a great place to highlight a couple of things that I've learned about Rust types. First of all, this collect method is pretty interesting because it doesn't return just a single type. Basically, collect is a method that can convert any iterator into any collection that implements the from iterator trait. So if you have, obviously this gives you access to a ton of built-in collection types like vectors and hash sets and other stuff, but if in your own application you need to build your own custom collection types, you can implement the from iterator trait and then you can convert any normal iterator into your custom collection type. So when we just say counts.collect, we haven't given Rust enough information yet to know what type of collection we want V to be. So we have to add a type annotation. There are a couple of ways we can do this. The main way I think is if we say V is supposed to be a vec of U size. Now counts as an iterator here, already knows that it is iterating over the type u size. And so we can actually save ourselves a few keystrokes here by using the underscore character here. Now, underscore is used in a couple of different places in Rust, and it pretty much always means I wanna ignore whatever goes in this place. And when we use it as a type here, basically it says, I don't really care about defining the type here, you should be able to infer it. And of course, Rust can. It knows that v here, if we look at the type, is gonna be a vector of u size elements because the count is an iterator over u size element. So it really just needs to know what the collection type is. So this is maybe the main way that you might explicitly type a variable in Rust. And it's really similar, of course, to the way TypeScript types things. So that's nice. However, there's actually another syntax we can use, and that is kind of like a generic parameter. Collect can take a generic parameter here. If we actually look at the definition of collect, you can see in the function signature here, collect has a generic parameter b, which is the same type that gets returned. And notice that as part of the signature, this is where B implements from iterator. So that's the trait that I was mentioning earlier. So we can use the similar syntax here where collect takes a generic parameter and declare what the collection type for V should be when we actually do our collect call. And there's kind of a weird syntax that Rust uses for this. You might expect that like other languages where you have generic parameters and functions, you just use the angle brackets and that's part of it. But we have to start with a double colon. So we have 
double colon and then our angle brackets here. And this set of characters here is actually called the turbo fish. Kind of special to Rust, but that's what they call it. So we've got our turbo fish here. And once again, we're going to say that this should return a vector of whatever type is inside of our iterator. And if we look at V again, we can see that it is a vector of U size elements. Now the editor is reminding us that we're not using the V variable yet. So let's go ahead and use that. The first thing we want to do is just sort it. So let's do V dot sort. And that way we can know which is the highest one because it will be the last element in the list. Now we run into another error here, and this is again a place where the Rust compiler is really helpful in editor. We get an error message. We cannot borrow V as mutable because it's not declared as mutable. The thing to take away from this is that every Rust variable that you declare is by default immutable. You cannot change that at all. And so when we try and do a sort, we're doing an in place sort on a vector that's mutating the vector. We can't do that without declaring that this should be mutable. So we have to declare this variable as mutable. And notice that we have some green text here, which is the Rust compiler suggesting where that change needs to be made. Consider changing this to be mutable by saying mute V instead of just V. We can say let mute V. And if I save that, our V variable is mutable and we can go ahead and sort that. Let's go ahead and grab the last index for this. Finally, we can go ahead and print the highest count is and that's going to be V at last index. This is our entire program. We should be able to go ahead and run this now. And once again, I'll do cargo run and we can see that the highest count is almost 70,000. This is part one of day one of Advent of Code 2022 done in Rust. Uh, there's a part two, which is a slight variation on this. I think you have to find the three highest counts. So if you want to take this and run with that, go ahead and give that a try. I want to hear from you guys in the comments. Do you like this video format? Like I said, I'm really new to Rust, but my plan is to explore and play with Rust a lot this year. And if you guys are interested in coming along on that journey, I'd love to make more videos where I just kind of work through basic problems in Rust and talk about how the language works based on my current understanding of it. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.